Okay, welcome everyone, and thank you for your attendance at today's webinar, uh, the why, who, how, and what of digital transformation. Uh, for those of you who have not met before, my name is Anthony McMahon, and I run a company, uh, The IT Psychiatrist. Um, the first time I've had the big banner out uh, in, in public before, um, so it's looking quite ominous over my back shoulder there, I do apologise. Uh, today I'm going to be taking, it, it, it's quite a high level journey through uh, the concept of digital transformation. Many of you will be familiar with it and I hope it doesn't feel like I'm, I'm telling you how to suck eggs on this, uh, but what I just want to do is, is put some myths to bed around digital transformation and give you some good foundations for how to start. Uh, for the benefit of those who I haven't met in person before, uh, my background, I've been in the technology industry for just under, or just over 20 years now, uh, where I've been working both in corporate and within my own consultancy firm. Uh, and I've also uh, been studying around uh, a, a range of different areas in technology. So uh, I have a Bachelor of IT and a Master of Management and together they've, they've given me a bit of a foundation on some of the challenges we see. Uh, as I said, what I wanted to talk about today um, in this presentation is just digital transformation at, at a high level. Uh, we're not going to go into solutions or anything. Um, there will be, uh, Neil, for your benefit, I will talk about digital twins a little bit later on. Um, that's Neil Calvert from Link, who specialises in, in digital twins. Uh, and for, for everyone else as well, though, I'm not going to be selling solutions, more just putting together a story um, and using a couple of case studies that I've come across in my time around where digital transformation has or hasn't worked that well. Um, bear with me as well, because I can't see any of you. I'm not going to get any of that feedback that you'd normally get in a presentation. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm working on a single screen at the moment, uh, just to not disrupt the flow too much. If you do have any questions, pop them into the Q&A. Um, that should be open for everyone, and I'll address them once I've got through the slide deck that I've got. It's about eight or nine slides, so we'll probably spend about 20 minutes, or probably about 30 minutes on that, um, and then we'll address those questions as we wrap them up. Um, and if anyone wants to follow up with me later, you're welcome to do so as well. So, digital transformation. First thing about it, it's not about the technology. It's, it's a series of iterative changes that any business needs to undertake in order to shift their model from where they are today uh, to where they need to be to be successful in the future. And as the graphic that's just appeared has shown, it's, it's the intersection of people, process, information, and technology. Um, and I just realized there's, there's one error on that slide. Uh, that bottom graph, that bottom circle should reflect technology. Um, and that digital transformation is the intersection where everything is coming together and we're actually seeing change within the business and within the core operating model for the benefit. Now I mentioned that I had some, some stories, some case studies to share, and one that I'm gonna talk about, uh, some of you may have heard me talk about this before, but it was a property inspection company um, based in the North Shore of Auckland, uh, where they were out, I think they had about five field agents who would go out, they'd inspect properties um, under their old model, they were, pulling together a lot of information on paper, which they would then send back to the office um, or take back to the office at the end of the day, leave in the in-tray and there was a, an office manager or an admin person who would take that information, create reports from it uh, the next day, so 24 hours later, um, and then those reports would be sent to back to the inspector who would check them uh, before passing them on to the clients, uh, to the customers. Uh, what this firm was doing was it was taking about at least two, um, if not three, and sometimes up to four days to get reports back to their customers. And if anyone's ever um, had a property inspection done, you know that speed is of the essence. Now, while there's an app for that, um, what this company ended up doing was they went through and bought iPads for the five field workers, and they gave them a digital form uh, to capture data. What they didn't do was anything else in the process. They didn't fix anything else up. And what was happening with the work was the field agents were going out they were collecting the data, they were filling in the form, they were emailing it back to the admin office. Um, the admin lady was then taking 24 hours um, after she printed them out and put them in her in show. She was taking 20, up to 24 hours to create the report. They actually hadn't slowed anything down, uh, sorry, sped anything up. All they'd done was change the way the data was ingested at the start, the information they were capturing, but their process, their people, and their technology wasn't changing with it. Uh, in an ideal state, what they would have seen was that that information was as it was captured in real time, was fed into uh, a process flow or a system that actually automatically generated the reports um, from, from the inspector. Uh, the office worker, the, the admin worker, could have still been in the loop and she may have been evolved from creating the report to validating the report and then sending it to the customer. 
Well, they may have been able to pull it out altogether uh, and have had the report sent straight back to the property inspector and then for, for a checking and then sent back to the customer. Uh, so that's one case that I've come across and, and there's many more out there similar to this where the digital process has been fixed at one point and there's been an ingestion point put in but the whole end-to-end -end process hasn't been addressed and it hasn't transformed the business in any way. And in some cases, it's actually created more cost, more bottleneck and more problems for it as well. So that's why I say that digital transformation isn't about the technology. It's the iterative changes that a business must undertake in order to shift their model and move them forward and get them ready for the 21st century. Uh, it's also, it's, it's not just related to purchasing of technology solutions, but it's making sure the people around have the skills and the processes are optimized as much as possible. Um, another example uh, I've come across, just, just to share quickly, uh, was where a bank, a local bank, switched on automated approvals in their lending flow. Um, they switched it on right at the start, so once the data was captured, if the customer met the right thresholds, their loan was approved and it was sent back to the fulfillment team. What they didn't do was fix anything up in the back end, so the fulfillment team received it and then continued to process the loans in the way they always had. What ended up happening was that there was a 400% increase in loans that were being approved right at the start and the, the, the fulfillment team couldn't handle it. So suddenly the customer experience uh, slowed right down and the customers were waiting longer to get the money that they've been approved for when the intent was to try and get it to them faster. So again, if you're not looking at the end-to-end -end process when you transform your business, you're going to fail to deliver digital change. And that's where some of the interesting stats that come about. 87% of companies out there believe that digital transformation will give them a competitive advantage. But two years ago, and this is statistics from Forbes, two years ago, 50% at least of all digital transformation projects failed or stalled, didn't continue through. Uh, and, and there was a couple of problems that generated that 50% outcome, uh, or the, the failure rather than an outcome, because there was no outcome, clearly. Uh, the problems first and foremost were that the, the businesses that were trying to transform didn't actually know where they were going. They didn't know what they were doing and they didn't know what the outcome they needed to achieve was. So as they started to do more and more within the business, it started to get harder and harder and harder. And for those of us uh, who have been around in, in the New Zealand landscape for at least the last decade, will know about the Nova Pay issue with uh, the payroll at, in the education services where the project, I think, started and took about 10 years to um, fail, ultimately. Uh, it got to a point where Nova Pay became synonymous with project disaster. Uh, and again, it came down to the point that the project wasn't quite clear on what it was ever delivering. And people within the project weren't quite clear on what it was delivering. The second problem that drives that 50% failure rate is that not only are the customers not sure what they're doing, but the solutions that are available to them don't always meet the problems they need to solve. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about problem identification uh, in a moment and a few more slides, um, but it's core cool that the solutions they end up purchasing, they've either purchased them because a consultant has given them a bad steer, or the consultant doesn't know what they need in the first place and hasn't asked the right question. Uh, the third stat there, which is quite interesting, it's, it's quite pleasing to see that it's low, but that's still one in five. One of five companies believe that they've completed digital transformation. Um, now, the thing with digital transformation, anyone who's been in the industry for long enough knows that it's never done. Once, as soon as you've evolved a process, you need to start again and continue to keep moving forward for that competitive advantage. Final one, um, intelligent systems. Now, this is, this is chatbots. This is uh, a, a level of machine learning and, and conversational AI. This is the work that contact centers have been doing. Intelligent systems will be driving 70% of customer engagements within the next two years. And if we think even over the last six months, what we've seen is we've seen a rapid shift away from face-to-face -face interactions and more of this kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one through Zoom. Um, what what may happen there, this statistic was a couple of years old, this may actually accelerate, we may see this changing by 2021 instead. So we're going to see more and more companies evolving towards uh, intelligent systems, using their data to, to engage with their customers correctly, and having solutions like chatbots, like conversational AI uh, at the forefront. People-driven contact centers will evolve to become more of a, a high-level problem solver rather than a customer service and fulfillment channel. And that's going to drive companies that aren't adapting and evolving away uh, as customers no longer want to work with them. Now, 
I'm going to take another moment to talk about another case study. And anyone who's, who's heard me talk over the last month or, or seen some of my posts on LinkedIn will probably have heard this one. Uh, talking about Blockbuster. Now we're all familiar with Blockbuster, um, hopefully, uh, as, as the video giant that disappeared when Netflix came along. And often Netflix is attributed as the reason that Blockbuster failed, but it's actually a lot more nuanced than that. There's a lot more to the story than just having this competitor that was able to do online streaming. And I'm just going to take us through a journey on, on what happened with Blockbuster and Netflix. So Blockbuster started in 1985. Netflix came along 12 years later. Blockbuster's model was stone and, uh, brick and mortar, uh, people coming in and renting videos, uh, purchasing um, everything they needed for a movie at home, and just basically uh, a, a good way for the home entertainment sector. Netflix's original model uh, wasn't streaming. 1997, it was mail order DVDs. So what they were was an internet gateway where people could go in, order DVDs, they were then sent out to the customer, the customer could watch them and send them back. So two slightly different models, um, solving a similar problem in the entertainment sector though. Netflix was offered for sale to Blockbuster in around 2000. I think at the time the buying price was about $50 million. Um, there's a few different times as to when it was, was up for grabs, but $50 million is a fairly consistent thing. At that point, Blockbuster said, thanks, but no thanks. We don't want to buy you. We're happy doing what we want to do. By 2004, Blockbuster had reached its peak. They had about 6,000 stores. Uh, they were pretty much worldwide, um, several thousand employees, and I think they were earning around $50 million in revenue themselves. Uh, no, sorry, um, $5 billion. Anyway, that, the number of revenue is by the by there. But at this point, they were starting to look to their, their Blockbuster Online channel. And what Blockbuster Online was, was a direct competitor to Netflix at that point. It was, again, DVD rental service where you could go online, you could rent your DVDs, Blockbuster would ship them out to you, and then you could drop them back in store. What they were even offering is if you took a free, uh, sorry, if you took a movie out online, when you drop the movie back, you could pick another one up for free. So they started to lose a little bit of revenue because they started to give some of their services away for free. Fast forward a year, Blockbuster abolished late fees. Now there's two numbers in here that, that are very interesting. The online service cost roughly $200 million to build. The abolishment of late fees cost the organization roughly $200 million in revenue. So one year before, they're spending $200 million on a, on a channel that they're now going to push forward, and then they remove the exact same figure from the business. So there was a huge amount that came out of the business from there. In about 2005, Netflix started to see what, what could be happening, um, and they offered to enter a partnership where Blockbuster would continue with the bricks and mortar, Netflix would take the online channel, uh, and they'd collaborate. So people could rent a video on a DVD on Netflix or Blockbuster Online, which would be the same service, uh, and then return them back to store and carry on. Blockbuster again said, no, we're not going to go ahead with this. It took them a while, but they said, no, we don't want to do this. Uh, what they were wanting to focus on was their own revenue channel. And if we fast forward to 2007, Blockbuster actually found that $200 million was a lot of money not to have coming into the business. And they started to, at this point, reinstate late fees. Not at a global level, but certainly many stores in many regions were starting to bring back late fees that were happening within there. Around about the same time, Netflix offered streaming. Now, roughly at about the same time as well, the CEO, in 2005, there was a switch of CEOs. The CEO who had abolished late fees was, was um, moved on by the board and they brought a new CEO in. And roughly in around 2007, uh, the, C the new CEO uh, started to take the focus away from investment in the digital channel. So Netflix is starting to look at online, Blockbuster's moving away from their digital channel. 2010, Blockbuster files for bankruptcy. Netflix is only valued at $214 million, oh, sorry, $24 million, throwing an extra figure in there. 2019, so just last year, the final Blockbuster store closed. And this year, Netflix was valued roughly around $203 billion. So in the space of about 15 years, Blockbuster went from dominant to non-existent. They were filing for bankruptcy within five years of that 15 years, whereas Netflix went from a point over, over 20 years where they were offering themselves to, for sale to the major competitor to being the dominant player in the market. And this is where the Blockbuster provides a really good case study into how digital transformation can fail. Blockbuster had every single opportunity to get it right and continued to make mistakes along the way. 
uh, one of the things that the mistake they made with the abolishment of late fees was that they had no way to replace that revenue. There was nothing coming in, uh, that the alternative was through the online channel and they were giving movies away for free if people brought them back to the store. What they were also losing out at the same time was by not having anyone come into the store, they weren't buying popcorn, candy, and all the other stuff that goes with it. So they were losing, losing revenue all over the place. They didn't change their business model and they didn't adapt to new ways of revenue. So they started to disappear. But one thing that's very interesting, and it's just popped up on the left here. This was the quote from James Keyes, the, the blockbuster CEO who took over in, in, in around 2006, 2007. He didn't see Netflix or Redbox. Now Redbox was the um, kiosk DVD rentals that were in supermarkets and, and in shopping centers. He didn't see either of them as competitors. They weren't even on the radar. His competitors that he felt were Walmart and Apple. So what he was seeing was that the competitor blockbuster was the retail bricks and mortar store where people could buy a movie and own it for, for good. In Apple's case, it was through the iTunes store where again, people could buy it. What they never saw coming was that Netflix would offer a streaming model as an alternative. And if you look into the history of Netflix, uh, they actually went through and did a lot of work to bring out the subscription-based service. And, and there was a lot of uh, activity that went in there to evolve them from uh, physical rental to, to streaming. But what, where they saw it was that people didn't want to own things anymore. They just wanted to be able to subscribe and consume. And when they first started uh, streaming in 2007, Blockbuster had 100,000 movie titles in their library, in their catalog globally. Netflix only offered 1,000 of them. So 1% of what their major competitor owned or offered, they were offering and they've gone and, and increased value exponentially year on year to be at the point where they're one of the dominant players and they've almost reached that point like Sellotape and some of the others where we talk about Netflix as a, as a, as a noun or as a verb rather than just as a business name. So again, Blockbuster failing to adapt key parts of their business model throughout their history led to them disappearing. It wasn't Netflix that drove them out of business. There's plenty of other examples of this. Kodak with the digital camera um, is, a, is another good example as well, which I won't go into today. So who needs to be involved in a digital transformation journey? Well, it's, it's, it's quite simple, it's, it's everyone. The customer needs to be at the heart. You know, one of the things that, that drove people away from Blockbuster and towards Netflix through the mid 2000s was when Blockbuster started to bring back their late fees to drive their revenue up, customers didn't care. Customers weren't going to, to Blockbuster because they were able to pay late fees. They were going to Blockbuster because they wanted a movie. And if there was an alternative to getting that movie without having to pay an additional fee, if they happened to forget the movie, they, weren't go they were going to go with that as well. So the customer was at the heart. You know, if you suddenly said to them, hey, we're going to make you pay something that you weren't paying for before, of course the customer's going to get upset. But everyone needs to be involved. It starts at the top and it starts at the bottom. Digital transformation starts with the C-suite. It starts with the people at the front line. Those are the people that can, can support and invest and get on board with the problem. Uh, whereas the staff at the front line are the ones that actually know where the issues are and they know what it's going to be, what it's going to deal with. Shareholders, I've got on this as well, um, because the shareholders are people who have to put some skin in the game to ensure that the business transforms. Now, if you think of the blockbuster shareholders, if you went to them and said in, in 2005 and said, you need to continue to invest in this model or we're gone in five years, most of them would have laughed. What we've now seen is that shareholders need to actually focus on that and say, if we don't make the change and if we don't invest money, we won't exist for much longer. Down the bottom, I've got other. Um, other being people around you that can bring the skills into the organisation that you don't otherwise have. Not every organisation is skilled up to have people who will come in and actually challenge uh, the thinking, um, challenge the, the, the behaviours and, and provide the, the guidance and improve where the business is going. So it's the other that's part of it as well as what skills haven't you got. As much as you can look at your staff and say what skills you've got, you do need to look at, look at everything and say what have we not got within the organisation. Um, and I've taken the liberty of um, adapting uh, Milton Friedman's quote from, I think it was back in the 70s where he was quoted as saying the sole responsibility, uh, responsibility of business is to turn a profit. Um, in, in my view, in this day and age, the sole respons responsibility of a business is to add value to customers. Uh, so we're moving that quote forward. And again, putting the customer at the heart of everything we do is the valuable part for any business. It's why they're there. Businesses aren't starting up to be vanity projects. Often it's because there's a need or a problem that needs to be solved that the customer needs to focus on. So how do you kickstart it? And again, anyone who's been following me for, for the better part of the, 
um, last two months will have seen this one. Um, you start with the end in mind. You know what, you look for the problems that you need to solve. You focus on where the opportunities are out there, and this is where the customer again becomes key, the frontline staff become key, the C-suite become key. The people who know where your problems are should be the ones telling you. You should be looking at what they are, you should be driving it in. Coming back to Blockbuster again, uh, the problems they needed to solve were not around uh, reinstating late fees or, or getting revenue back through late fees. The problems were their business model needed to completely evolve and adapt so that late fees weren't part of it. If we come back to that first story that I was talking about with the property inspection company, uh, again, the problem they had there was not that they were spending too much on paper to get their reports out. The problem was that the reports were just taking too long in general. The opportunity for them uh, that they could have been, should have been looking for was to automate that from end to end. Um, they didn't need to think of a solution. Again, there's an app, there's an app for that. They didn't need to have a solution in mind when they started. They just needed to know that what their improvement point was and they needed to focus on what factors were going to cause problems for them. Um, one, one piece around digging deeper into that property inspection company, uh, the admin lady who was doing the work, uh, creating the reports, she was ready to retire within three years after they bought the iPads in. So there was an opportunity there for them to completely revamp the business model before she left so that they didn't have to replace her with someone who was just going to create the same low value transactional tasks. And instead they could have brought someone in to own the product service queue of creating and developing reports and improving and improving and improving and trying to bring, bring that in. And again, this comes back to it. It's not just about the technology, it's about the people, it's about the process, and it's about the information. Once you've got through this, once you've got the end in mind and you know where you're going, you can start with the solution. And to take it away from technology again, you can put anything through this. Holidays, you, you could start with, need a holiday, where do I want to go? Rather than where do I got, want to go, it's what do I want to do? Do I want to surf? Do I want to fish? Do I want to relax on the beach? Do I like skiing? Do I want to go in the mountains? You know, start to talk about what everything is. By the time you've got to the end, the holiday becomes quite an easy experience and quite pleasurable because you haven't just jumped on a plane and flown somewhere. Unless that's the thing you like doing, in which case go for it. So what do you need to have? Well, I've called this not the only six principles of digital transformation. And the reason I've done that is that this is six that I see are important. There are others. Others will have different opinions on this and, and anything that can be added into this, this could be 10 pillars or 10 principles. It could be 20, it could be nine, it doesn't matter. These are just the six that I've focused on as important. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that can help you within this here as well. First thing, know your why. So coming back to the previous slide, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What is it that you need to deliver and why are you changing? Are you changing for the sake of changing or are you changing because there is a genuine problem that needs to be solved? Talk about Blockbuster a lot, but with Blockbuster, had they known why they were bringing in online and why they were abolishing late fees and why they were doing a few other things that have actually uh, probably had different decisions going on. Now, one of the reasons they abolished late fees was Netflix didn't offer them. So they were trying to meet that competitive demand, yet at the same time, some in the organization, James Keyes was part of the organization at the time, he didn't see late, uh, Netflix as being a critical competitor. So if you don't see them as a competitor, why abolish late fees to, to, to compete with them? So know your why, know what you're doing. Second to this, and I promise Neil I've talked digital twins and this is the point where I will, um, know your business. And knowing your business is not just about knowing what you're selling and, and the products you are, but it's knowing the processes you've got, knowing the people that are around you, knowing the services you consume and offer and how changes will impact them. And this is where a digital twin, which uh, partners and, and, and companies like Link down Wellington do offer, becomes very valuable. It allows you to map out what's happening in your business. It allows you to put measures and metrics around them, and it allows you to uh, model the changes that you're going to make. Uh, when Neil and I spoke about this a couple of months ago on a podcast, we talked about it as if it was a, a test sample environment for your business or a development environment for your business. It allows you to make those changes and see what's going to happen. Now, if Netflix had, uh, sorry, if Blockbuster had a digital twin, they could have modeled the impact of removing late fees pretty quickly. They could have seen what that did to their business and said that is removed late fees. Now, I'm not saying they didn't model, they definitely didn't have a digital twin. I'm not going to talk too much more on a digital twin. If you do want to know anything about it, look up Link Limited, L I N Q uh, Limited, uh, Neil Calvert, who's on board as well. Um, reach out to him. I do have um, a partnership with them as well, and I'd be happy to talk about it, but I don't want to get too focused on that in the, in the webinar today. Third one is know your challenges. 
um, to know what's going to cause problems for you uh, as you start to change and disrupt the business. Now, challenges could be from competitors, they could be internal, uh, they, they will be internal or external to be honest. The internal ones could be things like staff skills, staff knowledge, staff experience. Um, they could be uh, people who are wedded to, to certain ways of doing things um, or certain systems that, that have come on board. And anyone who's worked in a large corporation which has legacy and technology behind it will know that there's people in that organization who were involved in building the technology and don't want to be prepared to see it get turned off or, or retired or, or switched off. So know what your challenges are before you start. Make sure that you have them very clearly mapped out and you have them aligned to the problems as well because what those challenges will be is causes that impact the problems in the first place. So make sure you have those challenges mapped out and if you are able to, then make sure you're putting them in very clear terms as to why they're a challenge and what some of the solutions might be. Again, if you haven't got the skills in the business to, to transform it or to bring in new technology, one of the challenges you'll have as you bring in new technology is you're not going to be able to manage it. So one of the solutions will be go out and train people or bring the skills in that you need. Find the skills you need, either through training, um, what was the term I, I came across recently, coach it or poach it. You can either coach it into the business or you can poach it from somewhere else that's got it. Uh, never forget what you're selling. Never forget what services you're offering uh, throughout as well. Blockbuster never really forgot that they were selling movies, um, but they did also have revenue coming in from other areas. But there's plenty of examples of companies that never forgot or that, that did forget what they were selling and what their core product was. This is the point where some companies may pivot they may realize that what they're selling is not what the customer wants and they do have a product or a service that they're able to bring in that, that the customer is going to need and, and is going to fit a market need as well. So they're able to pivot and offer that new service. So, so think about this in terms of digital transformation doesn't necessarily mean a pivot, but it can lead to one. And pivoting is not always good for your business as well. Be willing to adapt. And this ties back to the pivot comment as well. So be willing to change what you're doing as you go. You may think that where everything uh, is coming from is, is always going to be where everything comes from, but be prepared to adapt and adjust your solutions, your strategy, your target as you go along. Think of this like how Google Maps, uh, when, when you're using it to navigate, helps you adapt around roadblocks, around deviations, around things. You know, As you're in your car driving, there's a roadblock ahead. You don't need to tell Google that there's a roadblock. It knows already and it starts to route traffic. You can also adapt um, using long range um, navigation as well, where you keep an eye on what traffic conditions are doing or what certain things are. And if you find that you're not arriving uh, at a destination in time because of that, you can, you can plan ahead. And that's where digital transformation is much like a journey. It comes back to that first slide where we talked about hiking the, hiking the digital transformation trail. Plan ahead, focus on what's going on ahead of you, keep one eye out. Um, as a pastime, I sail. Uh, with, with a couple of good friends of mine. And one thing that we are always aware of is that we need to look outside the boat to see what's going on uh, at all times. And it's the same in business. If you don't look outside, you'll come unstuck. And, and a personal story from this side, um, about three weeks ago, I was down um, at the local yacht club uh, on a Friday evening when the rum race was starting. The rum race is a social race where everyone just gets out and has a bit of fun. Uh, and what we saw, uh, what we witnessed was one boat colliding with another one, cutting it almost clean in half and sinking it. Now, the reason that started, that, that happened, is neither boat was clearly looking outside to see what was going on around them. One boat disrupted another one. The whole race was called off and everyone was called back in. So no one was looking outside on those two boats. Collision, no adaption. If someone had been looking forward in the boat that collided, and someone had been looking outside in the boat that got cut in half, it would have been a different outcome because they'd have been able to take steps to move away. Same lesson in business. If you're not looking outside your business to see what's happening, you're not going to adapt. And finally, this one should be big, it should be bigger than more, should have sort of eclipsed them. Focus on the customer. Again, the customer is the reason you're doing this. If you're not focusing on the customer as you change your business, you're, you may miss what it is they want. Again, coming back to Blockbuster, customers didn't want DVDs from Blockbuster with late fees attached. Customers just wanted DVDs they could consume. Netflix offered a very good model for that. Netflix didn't punish them if they, uh, if they didn't get it back in time, so they started to evolve to that. And then Netflix realized that what they actually wanted was the, the streaming model. Um, I think we can probably credit Apple a little bit with, with pioneering streaming um, through iTunes. They weren't pure streaming. You weren't able to, to keep everything on the go. Um, but Apple did pioneer it through uh, the iTunes model. So focus on the customer. 
And remember that change is inevitable, but you will never create a butterfly by sellotaping wings to a caterpillar. So don't blockbuster the opportunity. I'm gonna try and get that into common parliament, the parlance, that any company that fails to deliver change is blockbustering themselves. So don't blockbuster the opportunity. Make sure you're staying on top of what's going on. Make, make sure you've got the right people keeping an eye out for the opportunities that are out there and the problems, because without that, you won't succeed. Make sure that you change and adapt the models that you have around you as well. If you do have a digital twin, you're halfway there. What you need to continue to do is change that twin to meet your organization. Otherwise, it doesn't become a digital twin anymore. The minute you change your organization and not that, you've broken the, you've broken the connection between them. And the further apart they get, the harder it's gonna to be to do the modeling. So make sure that you continue to evolve the company. Thank you everyone, that's reached the end of the slide. So what I'm gonna do is stop sharing and um, cut back to uh, the, the Q&A side of this. If anyone's got any questions, um, feel free to pop them into Q&A. I see Link's got, uh, sorry, Neil's got the link, link there, link, 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 um, link.it, uh, link with a Q.it and link limited if you're looking for it on LinkedIn. Right, it doesn't have to be a question. If anyone's got any comments, they just want to pop in the chat, um, pop in the chat. Um, the, the link to link there um, because not everyone will have seen that in the chat. Um, so Neil's got a question here with the companies you've dealt with, where is the biggest gap in the knowledge and capability in terms of enabling good transformation? Um, I think the biggest gap uh, in many areas um, that I've come across with many of the companies is, has been knowledge and trust, um, second to which is um, decision paralysis. So where I've often seen companies fall apart is um, they haven't got people making good, clear decisions consistently. Uh, and, and that is that um, either, either the company's too large and no one wants to make the decision or no one wants to miss out on being given the credit for making the decision. Um, and what that tends to lead to is a little bit of a, a, a disconnect between what's going on. Um, The second gap, I think, within there is, is just the skills that are going into it and, and the people making the decisions may not have all the information available, available to them, um, but they also don't have the people around them that can help guide that information. So they don't have a good consultant or a good informer or influencer that's going to help them get to where they need. Um, and Sean, I, I see you put the comment in there as well, um, a big challenge being that organisations don't know what they don't know. So often in that case, they don't necessarily know they don't have the people around them to inform. Um, and what they're trusting themselves to is uh, a sales pitch or a vendor coming in and trying to tell them where everything's going to be fixed up and, and, and along the way. Um, and Sean <laughs> should have read down your point, you're, you're correct, that, that often vendors are there to sell rather than solve. Uh, and in my latest podcast episode with BizBytes, um, Alex McNaughton talks about uh, vendors need to be there or salespeople need to be there to solve problems, not to just sell solutions. So they should be there helping the customer and taking them through uh, the journey um, that, that we talked about as well. And I think we probably need to take it to the bar if we want to talk about Sean's other point about um, projects complying with um, frameworks, rules and checklists, because that is a big problem as well. Um, and it probably comes back to what you were asking, Neil, that often the project teams are focused on checkbox exercises. Um, or a second part to that is they don't involve the right people at the right time, but internally they've got bureaucracy. They may have um, uh, governance forums or change control boards, which are very tick box exercise. So their focus is to try and get through the process as, as painlessly as possible, rather than actually deliver the value to the customer. Um, the bit where I'm talking that they don't often involve the right people. Um, again, this is this is conversations that have come up and, and it, was, it was talked about in the, the episode with Alex they don't include the, the legal team, they don't include the, the privacy team, they don't include the security team in the conversations in the sales process early on 
So either the business that's buying says, oh, it's, they, they either don't know they need to include them, um, or they just assume that they're not going to add any value to the process and, and so they don't bring them on board. And the sales team don't ask to have them in the room. And the reason this causes a problem is as you try to transform the business and as you bring in new solutions, if you haven't got your legal team involved early and your security team involved early, uh, everything starts to fall apart from the business side um, because eventually you have to bring them in. And you might have brought them in with a week to go before go live, uh, but they have a six week cycle in their process because that's how long it's going to take them to get through and do their tick box exercise. So the more people you bring in early, the better. And that comes back to that, that um, circle slide that I had around who to involve. That's the other as well. It's the people who you don't know you need and that you should be talking to as much as possible. You should have a very clear expectation of the people that need to be involved in decision making and discussions as well. Any other questions? Or any other comments? All right, cool. I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, like I say, this will be, oh no, um, Neil's jumped on. Yeah, um, and thank you, Neil, for agreeing with me. I, I always like it when people agree with me because it means I'm um, on the right track. Uh, what Neil said, for, for those who, who can't see it, current processes prevent looking at the value created by the work that is done and outputs are not content, uh, I'm sorry, are not content that decision makers understand and need to get the stuff done. Um, again, Neil, uh, you, you're like me, I know Sean from, from conversations I've had with him uh, about this as well. Our focus is solving problems. It's, it's not there to, to deliver solutions. Um, well, it is to del deliver solutions. That's the end game of, of any process, but it's to solve problems first and foremost through the use of the right solution. Um, so thank you for that. We'll, we'll call it to an end there. Thank you everyone for um, joining today.